Delco Alliance. We are walking through John. This will be our last week in John for just a little bit. Um, we are next week's our birthday celebration, our birthday bash. Hey. And then the week after that is Vision Sunday. And then we've got two weeks to celebrate missions, uh, which we do, well, two Sundays to celebrate missions, which as an Alliance church we do every year. We have an Alliance, not a festival, what do they call it? We're still learning. Celebration. Celebration of Alliance missions, because that's something that is very much in the midst of our DNA. And then after that, we're doing like seven weeks in like a soul care-esque 1.0 kind of experience, focusing really just on identity. Uh, we were gonna try to do all the chapters of soul care, uh, and then realized if people started actually doing those things, it could get really intense really fast. Uh, because just stuff starts coming up and there's help that's needed. And like, if you've ever done any kind of internal healing work and stuff like that, like if you start getting on a roll, uh, things can get pretty intense. And so we're like, well, what if everybody, like, what if everybody leans in and does it? Uh, we don't know if we could help. Um, so we're going to focus on identity because if you don't get the foundational aspect of identity right, it is like the foundation of a house. Like the whole house is kind of in jeopardy. Uh, that's why we're going to spend so much time there. We're going to talk about people pleasing and what we do build it on. I think that's actually going to be really fun. Uh, I'm really excited about that. So this is, we're going to start this theme in John chapter six, and then um, come back to it in November. You guys know it's September now? Yeah. And the leaves are falling and changing and what the heck's going on there? So we're actually doing the feeding of the 5,000 today. We've preached on this before in two other gospels, uh, which makes sense because it's in every gospel. But it's cool how in this moment with the gospel of John, there's actually like a bunch of intervening themes and realities that John is trying to point to in his gospel that really hit home right at this moment. And there will be another moment where there's a similar kind of, uh, where the stars align, and it's actually gonna be in Jesus's Passion Week when he is washing the disciples' feet and he's celebrating com like communion, uh, or what will become for us communion. Um, and so it just was really cool to study this week. I learned a lot about how John is kind of orchestrating the story of Jesus and then how it hits us right where we live and work and play. So we're doing John 6, 1 through 15. And uh, I'm going to read it. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. If you want to follow along, I'll have it up here on slides. And then we're just going to talk about, as always, my favorite subject, like who is this Jesus guy anyway and who do people think that he is who would we even prefer that he was and who is he really this is fun so let's read this together John chapter 6 starting in verse 1 sometime after this so this is after the judgmental intense courtroom scene that we walked through for the last couple of weeks Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Just as an aside, this is like a triple imperative in the Greek. And so people kept following him because he kept walking and kept healing people. Right? So it's not like he did some stuff there, but just literally as he's going, he is healing people. It was super cool. So they are enthralled by this. And so Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. And the Jewish Passover festival was near. That's a key point. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Um, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. 
There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as he wanted, and he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled the twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over from those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So every gospel has this story in front of us, but John uniquely sets it at what time? It's a unique time and place for the Jews. It says it's during the festival of what? Passover, fun, fun. So the question is, if this is the, a singular detail that is trying to be pointed out by Jesus, what is the significance and what, what, can we, what are we supposed to do with this? Well, here's the thing about the Passover in John. This actually happens three times where the Passover is mentioned. The second time is the clearing of the temple. So he has come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover and he walks by the temple and sees what's going on there and he kicks everybody out and is very upset and knocks it over all the tables. This is the second time. In John chapter six, it's the feeding of the five to thousand. And then chap John chapter 11 is when they'll mention it again and it's the beginning of Christ's passion. It's interesting when we consider, again, how Scripture is written and layered, and there's just not a lot of opportunities that we have in the world right now to see similar kind of writing and similar kind of communication today, where the point is for this to draw us back, that no detail is wasted, right? So like I was reading um, N.T. Wright's uh, commentary on this, and he was talking about how like in a good mystery novel, you've got all these details, and you're trying to figure out which ones are important, because some of them are and some of them aren't, to figure out who done it, right? And he's like, the Gospels are not a mystery novel. Every detail is important, and every detail begs a question. And so if we have the Passover festival happening three times in a row, or three times throughout this gospel, it's not an accident. It's not like, and then Jesus just happened. It just happened to be Passover and he fed 5,000 people. Isn't that crazy? And then you go, man, that is crazy. And then you go on your day, right? This is the deeper work where we ask questions and why things like scholarship and the work of these things are important. Because look at John uh, 6, 5 through 7. All right. When Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. This testing phrase, right? We have been done a disservice by like a Western educational system where for us a test is what? Right or wrong. You're right or you're wrong, right? And if you are wrong, I hope you get better next time if you can. But if there's another test that has the same question and you didn't figure it out, you might be in trouble. Now. In a classic Western like educational system, that's not the case. And teachers, obviously, who care are not, they do not not care that you got it wrong. But like, I remember being a kid taking tests and being like, if I don't get this, like I'm in trouble, right? And I might, they might like tank my chances to do something significant in the world and we're all gonna die, right? So that's what anxiety tells you. This would not be the educational model that they would subscribe to when they talk about a test. Okay? A test for a Jewish person would very simply be, and this is what we would hope it would all be, it's just an opportunity to learn. Right? And so, like, if you think about Hebrews, when he talks about how um, the Lord disciplines his people because he loves them. Right? When we see the word discipline, depending on how you grew up, you might view that very differently than how a Jewish person would see it. Because there is an aspect of discipline that's like, no, like this is not okay. And I'm going to guide you forward to figure out how you can now live in the life that God has for you. But oftentimes, how is dis what is discipline actually? You did something wrong. Yeah, it's punishment. You did something wrong, so 
you're going to get nailed, right? And as a kid, you cannot make sense of that. Like, you cannot enter into the mindset almost like, like you, there's biological prohibitions that keep you from entering into the mindset of like, this is just an opportunity for me to learn. Now I know I'm not supposed to climb houses and jump off the roof, right? No, what you know is I climbed a house and uh, I jumped off the roof and then I got screamed at for an hour, right? That did not happen to me, so I don't, but... Right? And that's what discipline is. And so now I know not to climb up houses and jump off roofs. What you actually know is that if you get caught climbing up houses and jumping off roofs, depending on how that screaming was communicated to you, you know if you get caught, you will be in trouble. That's why you feel, that's why it's okay to, okay to cheat on tests. Right? It's like, it's not about learning. It's about getting the right answer. Which is like why in online schooling, like they think on average 80% of people are cheating in online schooling. If they, if they, in the statistics that they have. And so what are they learning, right? And I honestly, because of the way our education is set up, that does not really surprise me. Like that, I would also be very scared. Uh, that would be difficult to go through if you don't have a moral aspect to that. So John's asking Philip this question. And he's asking him to test him to see what Philip knows, to see what has become part of Philip's identity as a Jew. All right. Philip is the natural choice. And this is not something you could just know, like, off, but uh, because he grew up like half a mile away from where they are. So he they're basically asking Philip not to like single him out, but he would know the area. So Jesus goes up to Philip. He's like, what do we do with this? Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. This is where the Passover comes in, this Passover theme. So uh, if you know anything about the Passover, here's just like a quick sketch in Exodus. The Passover festival that they would be celebrating is a celebration of the moment of the Exodus, right? So uh, the people are enslaved by Egypt, they had become so numerous that the Egypts were threatened by them, even though a, a couple hundred years earlier they had been welcomed in by um, Joseph as he was in the time and he was in charge of some stuff. And so then they uh, immediately began to enslave them and put them to work. And so here's the key theme of the Exodus story, right? Of Moses going up to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go and he's got a staff and he throws it down and it's a scary snake. And then he like picks it up and it's not a snake anymore. And then the plagues and everything, right? You don't want to lose the meaning in the midst of all of this. All the stuff that we ask, ask, ask questions about and Pharaoh's heart is hardened. The key thing of the Exodus story is freeing the captive people. That's always what they're getting towards. The means, I think there are good questions about those. But the ends in terms of how it's then viewed later. And the reason there is now a festival that they've been celebrating for a very long time, thousands of years. Freeing the captive people of God into a new land, right? They are out in the wilderness. They are just, and I've like seen a map of how it traced along. It doesn't really make a ton of sense. Like when it says how they did this, you're like, how long, how can you walk in the wilderness for 40 years? And then you kind of see it on a map and you're like, you, I don't know if you guys just didn't know where you were going, or I just don't understand what this looks like, but it's like, like we used to an exercise with the young adults where they had to, the person in front had their eyes open, and then everybody had to put their hands on the shoulders of the person in front of them and close their eyes, which is a very fun thing to do. I don't know if you guys had fun, but I had fun watching. And, um, and you just, we are turning right. Right, and then all the people who have their eyes closed are like, oh God, why? Uh, and, and then Joe hurt his foot. And that's just how those things happen. So that's what it looks like to me when you look at a map. And there's one key figure of the Exodus story, and it's Moses. So we're here on the Passover festival, which is the freeing of the captive people of God into a new land. And there is one key figure of the Exodus story, and it's Moses. The, the themes are not subtle, okay? There is a prophet like Moses who is coming. We actually celebrated it on, um, 
Christmas Eve this last year. We talked like these people came and confronted John the Baptist and they said, are you the prophet? The prophet, capital P. And he goes, I am not the prophet. I'm not Elijah and I'm not the Messiah. So leave me alone. This, is, this obviously comes back up. This connection to John 1 and connection to John 6 and this connection to Moses and what Jesus is doing in the midst of it as a leader of a people out in the wilderness when all of these folks come out, these 5,000 people, to understand this new thing that God is doing. And so it's no accident that in John 2, on the Passover, Jesus cleared the temple because he did it in the name of the glory of the Lord to establish the Father's glory. He saw what was happening in the temple, and the thing he had established, which was a mimicking of the tabernacle in the Exodus, and that this was not the way worship was supposed to go. There is not supposed to be these money changers in the temple. These things are not supposed to be happening. It's the same glory that Moses fought for in the freeing of the captive, right? That he would go in front of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh would say, who is this God that you worship? I don't really care. We've got tons of gods. And Moses is able to call down fire. And he's able to turn water into blood, right? And really make Pharaoh's life not super fun. Because when God's people are enslaved to a perverted system that does not honor or glorify him, he's going to act on their behalf, right? And that's what we celebrate in the Passover. So they're in this system and they're in Egypt and the people had not yet seen what they were promised. And they'd been taken advantage of because Pharaoh was scared of them. Right? Because they become too numerous and too blessed. And so in Exodus 2.24, it says that the Lord remembered his people and his covenant with Abraham. He remembered what I'd always promised them. God had promised them that they were going to be a blessing to the nations. That he was going to put his spirit in them and write a new law on their heart. And he was going to send them all over the place so that his glory could be magnified. So when he clears the temples... This is a reality of freeing the captive people. Maybe they didn't even know that this was not what God wanted, maybe. But he's clearing out space because in that same temple, this is just where things get fun. This is the same temple that the spirit has left. That it used to be the place where people worshiped. And it used to be the place where people got down on their knees and they sacrificed to the Lord. And you know what these same priests that just in this last chapter, we were like, what are they doing? And like, uh, why do they accuse Jesus? And what kind of rules are they trying to set up, right? It's these same priests, not the literal ones, because they would be dead. But it's these same priests in their spirit that allow the spirit of the Lord to leave. And so when, when they're under attack from many enemies, you know what the spirit of those people said? is like, well, God will save us. We don't have to. God's never going to leave us. We can do what we need to do, right? And if we need to, like, bring in some other gods, like, that's okay. And we'll just make it happen. And God had enough, for better or for worse. And so it literally says that the priests in the Holy of Holies, they turn their back. They turn towards the east, which was for them a sign that they had turned their back on the way of the Lord. And Ezekiel, who's then seated, seated, seated on the east bank as his people are being taken, taken into captivity slowly, he sees a vision of the God's throne on a chariot of fire leaving the temple. Which does not mean he's left them as a people, but he said, I'm no longer going to bless them with my presence. Right? He's like, I'm done with this. This is that same temple. So when the people are enslaved... God raises up a leader named Moses who then talks about another prophet who's going to come when the people are enslaved with a new leader, the prophet, who's going to do something extraordinary that no one has ever seen before. Right? Hmm. The people are enslaved by the Romans. When we meet the Jews here in the wilderness and they're asking questions of the Messiah, even the religious leaders are asking John the Baptist, like, what do we do with this stuff that you're talking about? They are poised for something new. They are ready and they are hungry to figure out what is God about to do with us? We've been waiting for so long. We've been waiting in our hearts 
We've been waiting to be freed. And this is what the Lord has promised us. And so what we're beginning to see a picture of as it, as, uh, as John moves us forward, it's a picture of a new exodus. It's a really long way to get to this point, I know. But this is kind of the reality of all of these pieces fitting together as Jesus is not really anxiously proving who he is, but simply says, like, I am the new Moses. Uh, you challenged me about the Sabbath and that I made the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for me, right? And now we're out in the wilderness and he's like, how are we going to take care of all these people? Philip, and Philip's like, I don't, I don't know. And you know what Philip forgot? That Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Lord, that he is ushering, he's the new Moses who's ushering in a new exodus. And what did God do during the exodus when the people asked the question, how are we going to eat? You guys know? They're out in the wilderness and they're like, Moses, what the, you know, they're always complaining. But what do we do? What are we going to do out in the wilderness? What are we going to eat? He does what? Do what? Yeah, they, he sends manna down and he feeds them. He feeds them bread. It's not literally bread, but it's something like bread. Uh, he feeds them bread. I do not understand. This is like, I've learned a lot of things. I do not understand how Jesus' life, like on a cosmic scale of justice, this is something that still messes with me. I do not understand how Jesus' life fits together to bring all of these pieces together. Like I could go to the details, but like if I were doing a cosmic redemptive work and I was God, I would make it just like really flashy and like maybe even make it more in like the 21st century when he could have the internet, right? And have access to that where like he could get to everybody. I don't, I don't understand the 30 some years walking at a very slow pace around Jerusalem, trying to figure out, like, I don't think he's trying to figure out anything. Everybody's trying to figure out what he's doing. And he's walking at a very slow pace, like the average person walks three miles per hour. Can you imagine going your whole life moving three miles per hour wherever you were going? That would be very frustrating. Most of us could not work where we work uh, because it would take a very long time to get there. And somehow, like, like, I get that it makes sense contextually, but like, He's bound by time and the limits of seconds and like the movement of his body and like sleep. And it just does not make a ton of sense to me. And maybe that's the whole point, right? Because Andrew comes in John 6, 8 through 11. So another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up and he goes, here's what I got, okay? I've got... Five small barley loaves and two small fish, uh, but I don't understand how they're going to go with so many, right? If this is the God of the Exodus who was able to sustain thousands of people, and this is supposed to be part of their Jewish identity, the question for us, the, what, the question that was for them as part of their test, and the question that is for us is like, how have they forgotten what God has done for them? Right? That's kind of what the feeding of the 5,000 asks us to sit in. Is like, and maybe this is exactly why you didn't come in the age of the internet. But like, and with our shortened attention spans, no offense, I hope that doesn't offend anybody. I know I have a shortened attention span. Why is it so hard to remember the good things that God has done for us? Why was it so hard to remember for Andrew and for Philip to remember like, oh, you know, every year we celebrate this thing called the Passover where God did these incredibly miraculous works and sustained our people for a really long time on nothing. And now I'm supposedly, you know, sitting with the God of the universe in the wilderness and we've got 5,000 people to feed and I am panicking, right? Like I look just like everyone else looks when they're hit with this situation. I just don't know what to do. And I'm freaking out, right? The first part of this story is kind of like very anxious. It's kind of like if you were to host a great banquet and you didn't know how many people were coming and you're just like running around with your hair on fire. Like, I don't know, it could be 100, it could be 2,000, it could be how are we gonna get all this food? Who are we gonna ask to cater it? 
Uh, how are we going to do a good job? Why are our tablecloths so dirty? Uh, how many chairs do we need? You know, random things like that. Like you would be running around if there was that high expectation. Why are they, why are they able to forget this? And then immediately starting in verse 10, there's a total shift in tone, right? Of like, uh, oh no, we need to figure something out. And then it starts in verse 10 and it just goes, well, you know, like Jesus said, have the people sit down, right? Scarcity at first. And now there was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks and he distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. It moves from like, we don't understand how any of this is going to work, to Jesus just being like, well, hey, you know, we got a lot of graphs and stuff. Like, everybody take a seat, and I'll just start handing stuff out. It reminds me of stories I would hear, like, what is fun about being part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance is like, the Lord's doing miraculous stuff all the time. And it's really fun to hear stories about it. Like, I was just recently talking to somebody who runs a medical mission, and, um, there's people coming in to get like their wounds wrapped and there's people coming in to get some penicillin and there's blah, 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 right? And they run out of medicine. Like they just ran, ran out of supplies. There's nothing more they can do. People are like walking through the jungle to help with their infections and there's nothing else. All they have left is this tiny bottle of uh, Pepto-Bismol. This is it. This is all they've got. So this doctor just like starts handing them cups of Pepto-Bismol, hoping for the best. And here's the thing, they served a hundred people, that tiny bottle of Pepto-Bismol, it never ran out. And all of those people, not with like the breaks and the cuts, but all of those people who were sick got well. And I don't know, like, what do you do with that? Like, that would be a very anxiety inducing moment where like you do a post-mortem and be like, well, how do we never run out of medicine ever again? But the miraculous element of that faith of just handing it like, I don't know, this is all we can do. And people being made well. And supplies not running out. And everything now is enough, right? There's now enough of everything. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. So there's more than enough left over. Let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had I've held a barley loaf. Uh, it is a coarse, grainy, like rough bread that's hard to chew. And the only reason probably those fish were present would be to make that bread more palatable because it's gross. Like it's not good. Uh, and so Jesus takes these poor person's elements. Like people even say this would be this boy's sack lunch. And I don't think so. I think that'd actually be like that family's meal that they're gonna eat that day, right? Because it's gross. And, it, and he takes it and he distributes it and people are thankful and there's some left over. The enough here is the connotation that everyone was totally fulfilled and they gathered what was left and we have a miracle in the desert of a people filled up on the Passover in the new Exodus. And this is not, and what they're trying to reiterate is this is not the first time this has happened at all. This happened for 40 plus years. <laughs> it's not subtle. It's not a subtle story, right? It's not even really that subtle what Jesus is trying to do here. It's a very clear kind of message for the people of God that he's trying to serve. And he's literally about to, in the whole next chapter, he's going to say, like, I'm the bread of life. Like, if people want to be well, made well, they need to eat of my body, right? So he's not even going to, like, let, he's not even going to let the disciples be like, what is this thing? He's like, no, I'm the bread. I came to fulfill this. He is the manna in the wilderness. He's come to bring fulfillment and total restoration to the people who know him. And he is a new Moses who has come to free the captives and bring them to a new promised land. And that's what Jesus presents to us. That's what we got, to, that's what we get to experience when we call Jesus Lord, is that we were taken out of bondage and captivity and brought into new and abundant life, right? That's the reality of what we got to, we get to experience. 
And sort of the kicker of this whole story, that's kind of hard for me to stomach at the end, in like the post celebration and like the discipling and the, you know, I haven't been a Christian a super long time, but even in the way I was taught to think about who Jesus is, it's these last two verses. This is kind of the kicker. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Yes, thumbs up. So like what I say to people that I'm talking to a lot is like, you are totally right, but in the most wrong way, right? That's the right answer in the wrong spirit. Because you nailed exactly who Jesus is. However, Jesus knew something, that they intended to come and make him king by force, and so he withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This is what, that's what's difficult, is they knew exactly who he was, and that's true of most of the gospel. Like, even the Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, they almost certainly had an inkling of who Jesus was. They just didn't understand what was going on. I know Stephen, even last week, talked about how we use scripture the wrong way to justify our own prejudices and the things, or just our preferences, things that we like. Uh, so these Pharisees and Sadducees, they accuse him of heresy on the Sabbath. And uh, Jesus simply responds like, I am the Sabbath. I don't even, this, this whole situation doesn't even make sense. It's not even the right context. There's a new Sabbath and a new Moses, and that's me. And then Philip, one of the disciples, when he's challenged about if the sustenance is going to be available to the people, he forgets that the God of the Exodus was the one who brought food to the wilderness, right? Even though that's supposed to be part of his identity as a Jew. And now the people, right, the people, they remember that Moses did say that a prophet would come. And they were right when they said that they found him, but their reaction was wrong. And what they mean by, by force, they're not going to like handcuff him and say, this is our king now. They're just saying, we're, they're ready to start a revolution. They're ready to like cut some heads off, right? Uh, they're ready to rebel against Rome with violence uh, to overthrow it. Here's the thing about the new Exodus, though. This is what's hard. God did not free his people in the book of Exodus through a political war. At least I don't read it that way. I'd be shocked if that's the conclusion we came to. Uh, the main difference between the old Exodus and the new Exodus, the main difference, is that the person who's coming as the prophet that they were waiting for is God himself. That's the big difference. So in the book of Exodus, God used Moses, who was a stuttering, angry, very hesitant uh, man, in all of his imperfection. And Moses, you know, he does a pretty good job. He gets like a B plus at the end. He doesn't get to go into the promised land, but he tried. Right? But he did a pretty good job. But that's not who Jesus is. Because... God heard his people's cries in Exodus 2 and sent Moses. But what Jesus came here to do are from the cries that Jesus heard all the way back in Genesis 3. Right? That when sin and evil came into the world, there's a reality in which immediately there's a spiral downwards for God's people. And the story all the way up to Genesis 11 is people discovering how evil impacts the world and how they can manipulate it and distort it for the sake of their own gain. Uh, and there's just story after story to the end, like obviously with the Tower of Babel, like we're gonna become God. We're gonna build a tower and figure this out. We're gonna knock on heaven's door. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Um, but the Lord knocks it over. He made a commitment in Genesis 3 that he's gonna right the wrongs that were there, and we knew, see immediately that he's ready to crush the serpent under his heel. And so Jesus is from that moment preparing to come and to help. And he's not kind of a bumbling fool. He's a human, but he doesn't quite have some of our same uh, problems. And he's there, as we saw literally again in the very first chapter, as John the Baptist calls him, he's like, I've come as the sacrificial lamb of Passover. That's what I've come. I've not come to start a political war, I've come to sacrifice myself, right? To make this possible. And so Moses did not have to die for the people to be freed, 
But Jesus is choosing to do that. He's choosing to come himself as God to give people the opportunity to be made new. And he did not have to do that. And so we stand today, 2,000 years later, with lots of misunderstandings and frustrations with the world as God has given it. And there's a lot of confusion. And it is really tempting to cast God in our own image as opposed to what he really tells us about himself. And this is like the primary work of some really hard aspects of discipleship in the West today that's just really like, I just hear some really tough things about what people think God is trying to do in the world and who he's trying to make people to be and what he's trying to force people's hands into and in, in their opinion. And I'll be honest, it just does not sound like the God that I know and the God that I've experienced. And it's like nationalism runs rampant and people are more settled into their political parties than in their Christian identity. It's just a very, I think it's a pretty scary, not like scary like I'm afraid of the outcome, but it is a scary time to lead. Um, it's a scary time to lead in all of this. R.F. Bailey has this really great quote. He's a scholar from England. This is kind of how he summarizes what the people thought were happening. Jesus, who is already king, has come to open up his kingdom to men. That's what he came to do. But in their blindness, men tried to force him to be the kind of king that they want instead. Thus, they failed to get the king that they want, and they also failed to lose the kingdom that he offered them. And I think that that's tough. I don't think, I don't fall into a camp that thinks your salvation is like on the precipice of like about to go over the edge every time, you know, you do something naughty. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think you're usually going to be okay. However, especially in terms of what you can experience on earth, there's a lot of questions that I like to ask people about who they think their king is and what he's really trying to accomplish. If they're trying to make God into something that he is actively choosing not to be, and if they're putting things onto people that they don't really want, um, if they believe in a God who's like pretty condemning and like pretty forthright in his like, I'm gonna knock you down kind of mentality and pretty quick to withdraw his presence from them when they mess up some things, I find some of that pretty confusing and hard to sit in. Not because I've not experienced it, I know exactly what that feels like, but because I've just, because I've experienced it, I've realized how much that is not the God of the universe in the way that you get, we have an opportunity to experience him. And that that character does not get in the way of doing justice in the world at all. The issue is just that God gets to define what justice is. The only promise that God has given us about justice in the world is that at the end of all this, when we're all done and we wrap up the blanket and all the toys, then every wrong will be made right. Right? That's when we'll see it. But today, there's a lot left out. Like, there's a lot of question marks. There's a lot of like, well, isn't this the right thing to do? Like, shouldn't I be trying to make this right and I'm like maybe but I don't know if you I don't know if that's your job or the Lord's job I, don't, I really don't know I think it gets scary when we try to take too many of those things in our hands and so we're supposed to always be finding our own motivation and our own self in this store in these stories and I don't know if you find yourself in the place of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law from the previous chapter where you're trying to fit the character of God in these boxes that don't quite work and it's making you miserable, right? This is what I often find with people who have been Christians a long time and it's not working, right? Like, they're not getting better. They're not experiencing joy. They look a lot like everybody else when stuff hits the fan, right? And they're realizing that they're kind of miserable and not having an abundant life experience? I ask those kind of questions. You could find yourself in the perspective of the disciples who 
doubt a lot and who despite all of their past experiences and all the things they've seen so far, not just for them specifically, but the stories of God's goodness and faithfulness from generations, every time something hits the fan, they always, they forget and they doubt and they're not sure who God is anymore anytime something bad happens. Or if you find yourself like the people who really just want to arm wrestle God into a position of blessing through their works or through what they think they're supposed to be doing. I don't know where we fit, where you might fit into that today, but a huge challenge of the life of discipleship is not just knowing who he is, but who he has been and who he will always be. And it's integrating the story of God into our story and into our life, especially in a time where we're almost encouraged to not integrate our past into who we are today in a time where it's like, well, you don't need to worry about that thing. Like that was bad and you, you're best off not thinking about it. And I'm like, where did you get that idea? Right? Like that's not going to serve you. You're going to show up in the present today and wonder why you keep doing that stuff. And it's not going to make any sense. And it doesn't make sense without integrating aspects of your past. We live in a nation that kind of wants to forget huge parts of the past on both sides. And if you forget the past, then you're always going to show up to stuff and be like, how did this get here? And why is this the way that it is? And should I care about it? Right? Whether that's all kinds of historical things. But we're kind of like okay with that. And I actually minister to a lot of people who are like, well, I don't want to think about the past because I don't want to give power to it. And the issue is it already has power over you. Uh, you just don't know it at that point. You haven't integrated your story. You haven't taken the time to like actually give a lot of those things over to the Lord. And remembering the moment that God brought you out of Egypt, right? And ushered you into a new exodus and gave you an opportunity to experience abundant life. And those tiny little miracles where at the time you were like, how could this get any better? And now you're in the present and you're like, I don't even know if any of that stuff's real. That's strange. I think it's strange. It is tempting to let the challenges of the day prevent us from trust and faith that the same God who did all those things continues to sit on the throne today. He's given us a new law that he's written on our hearts and he's given us a new spirit to live out its fruit. And so when you have a God who has been to you, Jehovah Jireh, like your provider, and Jehovah Rapha, your healer, and Jehovah Ra'a, I think that's right, your shepherd, and Jehovah Shema, your present friend. When you've lived seasons like that, then the present makes, and you're able to talk about it, the present makes more sense when we remember those things. Otherwise, there's going to always be a little bit of confusion. And that's the challenge for us. To say. That was the challenge for Andrew. That was Philip's test. Does he remember the God of the Exodus? Does he remember the things that he had experienced? And that's kind of the question for us today, I think. And so we're going to enter into our response time for a little bit. I know I went a little bit long. Apologize. We're just going to take a couple of minutes on your phone, in your journal, on one of the note cards on the table. There's just a couple of questions. It's not an expectation to get through them. But I just want to provoke us into thought that when you look at your life, who has God been to you and what do you need to remember about his character? What is he displayed to you and why is it hard to remember these things another question in terms of that because of who he's been what does it look like to worship the Lord appropriately today maybe you want to take a moment and give thanks for the things he's done for you maybe there's things you'd like to confess maybe there's things you'd like to repent of maybe there's somebody you'd like to talk to I don't know and then number three who do you need the Lord to be in your current circumstances I mean, we're always going through stuff. What does it mean to call on the Lord in the midst of all of that and ask really good questions about what he's doing for us? So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll take a couple of minutes to kind of sit in the midst of some of those things. And I'm just going to ask the Spirit to bless you guys and give you an opportunity to hear from him. So please just pray with me. Uh-oh.
Jesus, we're just super thankful for that you are the new, the God of the old and the new Exodus, that you've provided for us over and over and over and over again. You've given us every opportunity for obedience, that your character demands that we remember who you've been. Lord, would we be able to just sit in the midst of thankfulness and hear from you even now? We pray, come Holy Spirit to hear your word. Pray, Lord, that there would just be a sweet moment for each of us to hear what you have to say about who you are and then who we are in the midst of that. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We'll just sit in that for a couple of minutes.